Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome friends to another week of the choices we face. I'm Peter Herbeck. Our guest today is Dr. Andre Velenuve. He's a theologian, Catholic biblical scholar, assistant professor of, at the Honors College from Azusa Pacific University. And he's got a wonderful story, an amazing story. Of, it includes conversion and reversion and God's action and Israel and all kinds of wonderful stuff in it. So welcome, Dr. Andre. Good to be here, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, I had the privilege of uh, spending a little time with you yesterday and hearing your story. There's just so much to it. And I wonder, maybe let, let's just start at the beginning. Tell us where you're from and your family life and faith life as you were growing up and just kind of get into the journey. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. So I'm a born Canadian. I grew up in a Catholic family. Um, went to school like every normal Canadian kid. And uh, I was not extremely convinced with my faith uh, growing up, but uh, you know, our parents took us to, ch to church. And then uh, in my early 20s, basically, I started tuning out. I dated a girl who was a bit, or very anti-God, anti-Catholic. And uh, so I tend, I like to say I kind of pressed the reset button of my religious beliefs. I left Canada, I went to study in Austria, studied uh, jazz saxophone uh, in Graz, Austria. And at that time I was not, I suppose I was still Catholic, but not particularly convinced and just basically living my life. And I guess searching for meaning in life and uh, trying to make it as a musician, trying to find uh, something that would bring me satisfaction, I guess, and meaning. And uh, what was a, a major turning point is that I went to Bosnia and Croatia during the civil war there during the 90s. And uh, really, I didn't plan this. I was going there out of, out of humanistic motives, I, I suppose you could say, just uh, to help people. And I went there and worked with this little Christian uh, humanitarian organization called uh, River of Life. And those were Christian believers, evangelicals, who really did things uh, out of their love for God, their love for Jesus. And uh, that intrigued me very much. Uh, I went there trying to help refugees materially, but then I realized I really did not have that much to offer them. Yes, it was good to give them food, uh, but really I did not have much of a message of hope for them. So this little organization really struck me in how they had more than just material help to offer those refugees. And it started, I mean, I had been thinking about life before and I never gave up my, my belief in God, uh, but it really kind of, really prompted me in the direction of going towards a more meaningful faith, you know? And so they connected me with a little church, Pentecostal, I suppose, evangelical, a little on the fundamentalist side in, in Graz, Austria. And I started going there. At first, I didn't even know it was not a Catholic church. It was like, well, this is cool. You know, they have kind of modern worship music and they really f encourage us to read the Bible, which was not a much of an experience for me growing up as a Catholic. I was not really encouraged to, mm -hmm. to read the Bible. And, you know, they had the typical altar calls type of thing, you know, Jesus died for your sins and you're all sinners and have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And the more I read the Bible, it really didn't really take that long, you know, a couple of months maybe after going to that church and then there was an altar call and I said, yeah, I suppose I'm a sinner and I suppose I need a Savior. Was it, was it just a logical thing or was there something happening? Did you, did you experience the power of God in some way moving you? And what was your experience? Sure, there was both. It was certainly intellectual because I was reading the Bible and learning to love the Bible as well. 
and uh, reading a lot of apologetics as well. Who is the person of Jesus? And is he the C.S. Lewis famous trilemma, right? Lord, liar, or lunatic. Uh, G- Jesus never really left that option to, to say that he was just a good person, right? You have to make a choice. Who do you say that I am? He says to, um, to the disciples. So it was intellectual, but also deeper than that. As I said, you're looking for meaning in life. I was trying to make it as a musician. It was a great life, but there was a certain emptiness, um, a certain dealing with sin in my life, you know. Uh, what do you do with guilt, you know, when you do things that you know are wrong? Uh, so this seeking reconciliation, forgiveness, certainly there was very, something very experiential about that as well. So you, how, long, how long of a time did you spend with them then? With the this church? church? This church, yeah. Well, I kind of, I call it my seven years of not Babylonian exile, I suppose, but seven years as evangelical exile, okay. which I probably shouldn't say that because I'm very grateful for those yeah. years. And I still consider myself an evangelical, mm-hmm. aren't we all call, called to be evangelical yeah. Catholics? Evangelically Catholic, and, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. So then what, hap- what, what do you think the Lord did with you the most during those seven years in mm-hmm. terms of your own growth? Mm-hmm. Gave me a great love for scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a really good experience with praise and worship, this idea that praise and worship is not just singing songs, but uh, it's, uh, isn't it Augustine who said he who sings uh, praise twice or something of the like. Mm -hmm. Uh, So prayer, praise and worship, love for scripture, I guess being in a charismatic uh, community, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And um, also the imperative to, to go out and evangelize. There was a strong focus on that. So, I realized that being a Christian is not just getting our act together before God, but it's really, it's a call to to go out and spread the good news. And that's where my life really started shifting from being totally on the track of trying to become a professional musician. I also saw the idolatry in the the music school as much as I loved uh, jazz and I still do. Um, to see how you, you make it a God. You can make of anything your God, right? Especially in the arts, because there's something, there's a, a, a draw towards beauty. Yeah. But I started seeing a certain emptiness. And so I started shifting from uh, wanting to be a professional musician to really serve God in a way, either in the mission field or uh, through scripture study, uh, working for the church. So during those years, you were both play, playing professionally, but also playing in a worship band or something? Right, the correct. Church? Okay, yeah, great. That's right. So then what happened at the end of the seven years? Why did you, what caused you to move on and where'd you go from there? Well, before the end of the seven years, uh, I had a really a big turning point. It was in uh, 1997. So I had two major trips that changed my life. February, I went to Israel for the first time and spent three, three weeks there. It was absolutely fascinating with the country. And then in October, I went to India on, on a mission trip with a team of uh, Germans and Americans. And I saw incredible miracles and healings. And it was the type of massive crusade uh, where you know the pastors preach the gospels to tens and, and tens of thousands of, of Indians, many of which, most of which had never heard the gospel before. And basically a call to, to conversion, to transformation and uh, you know, the blind seeing literally and paralyzed children getting up and walking. So the things, as we hear in the gospels, I saw them with my own eyes. So yeah. I realized when you say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's really true if we have faith to believe in the great works that he's calling us to do. So all that's happening in that environment, in that church, but somehow the yeah. Lord led you yes. back to the Catholic church. How'd that happen? That's right. So to make a long story short, I moved to Israel in 1998, where I went to study at the Israel College of the Bible. And um, I, studying the Bible more and more, encountering Judaism and also studying the early church, at this point I was pretty fervent anti-Catholic. Uh, coming out of this fundamentalist church, a lot of theology that I was taught uh, basically convinced me that the Catholic church was very non-biblical or even anti-biblical. But I started to change moving to Israel, uh, looking at, well, encountering Judaism, seeing how Judaism is a very liturgical faith they don't believe in anything like salvation by faith alone. They don't believe in anything like scripture alone as the only source of authority. So they believe that to be right with God, you need to have faith, but, but you also need to, to do, do good, right? And they also have a strong belief in oral tradition, what they call the oral Torah. So I started seeing a lot of parallels between traditional Judaism and Catholicism. So I thought, huh, this is kind of interesting. And then studying the early church fathers as well, seeing how 
uh, people like St. Ignatius of Antioch and Irenaeus had very early, they had belief in the real presence. They had beliefs in the veneration of the saints, uh, apostolic succession, you know, bishop, priest, deacon. So I, I started, it started to bother me. It's like, huh, I guess these Catholic beliefs showed up really early in the history of the church. Yeah. And so what caused you to, what happened that you finally just made the decision yeah. to become Catholic again? Yeah, so I, that's kind of softened me. It took, it took about a couple of years. So I started saying, well, I guess the Catholics are not, it's not as ludicrous as I thought it was. I guess they do have a point for some of these, these ideas. And then at this point, I, I had become open enough that my parents who had this ongoing dialogue uh, with me, uh, not to say dispute uh, yeah. over the, the, the last few years. Uh, so my dad gave me this book by this uh, little known guy called Scott Hahn okay. and yeah. uh, called Rome Sweet Home and uh, Surprised by Truth, a compilation by Patrick Madrid. So I read those and at this point I knew I was in trouble. At this point I was a worship leader in a Messianic, Jew Messianic Jewish congregation in Tel Aviv. Um, so I read those books I felt very much intellectually convicted that I had to make my way back into the Catholic Church. A Messianic Jewish community is, is a group of Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah. That's correct. Right? Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So uh, w when did you pull the trigger and what was it like being surrounded by all these folks who you've been so close to for so long? How did that all work out? Uh, not very well initially. It was quite a turbulent period. Uh, so I just started asking questions that were very uncomfortable for them. How do we know that all the truth we were supposed to know to follow God is contained in Scripture? How do we know there's nothing more? Does the Bible ever teach that? And of course, the Bible does not teach sola scriptura. The Bible never says that. Uh, I questioned also this whole thing of salvation by faith alone. And the community, this Messianic community, was pretty anti-Catholic as well. And that started to bother me too. I was saying... Things like, well, you know, I've just, I was just reading about Catholicism and actually Catholics don't worship Mary if you actually look at what the church actually teaches and they just prefer to remain in these kind of crass caricatures of kind of demonizing the other in order to be more entrenched in their position. So those questions did not go over well and at some point I just had to, I was asked to, to stop. I couldn't lead worship anymore. And I was asked to take some, a step back and rethink my theological questions. And I did rethink them, but it did not lead in the direction that they wanted. So, so then what, how did you, what was it like to come back into the Catholic Church? It was very anticlimactic, Peter. It was almost a disappointment because I went to confession and I was given three Hail Marys for seven years of schism, apostasy, and heresy. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking, you know, at least a couple of years sackcloth and ashes. Yeah. But uh, I guess it was great work of grace. So I went to confession at uh, St. Anthony's Church in Jaffa, which is, of course, the place where Jonah fled his calling and where Peter got his vision of the, of the sheets of where the, the mission to the Gentiles began. So I thought there was something prophetic about that, about my own return to the, oh, yeah, to sure. the Catholic Church in, in Tel Aviv, Jaffa. Yeah, wonderful. Now, uh, then you went on to study Catholic, uh, more Catholic Bible study and theology. What happened there? Like, where did you do that and how long did you do it? And Correct. Well, since my reversion happened through Scott Hahn, I looked up who is the Scott Hahn and I found out he teaches at a place called Franciscan University of Steubenville. So at this point, I got connected with the Hebrew speaking Catholic community in Israel. Uh, I got to know a, the, uh, the vicar of the community, uh, Jean-Baptiste Gourion, a Frenchman who lived in Abu Ghosh, this little Benedictine abbey outside of Jerusalem. And I told him, yes, I just returned to the Catholic Church. I was working with the Messianic Jews. I'd love to serve the church in Israel. And I said, I would love to go and study because I'm, I've, I have this newfound Catholic faith. And I told him about this place called Steubenville. And I said, I'd love to study there. He, so he said, fine, we'll send you there and go get your master's and then come back and help us uh, when you're done. So off I went to Steubenville for a couple of years. Very good. And then you went back to Israel went again? Went back to Israel afterwards, right. What, what did you do there? Like, what was the purpose of going back? Well, initially it was to work with the Hebrew Catholic community, but then I started also a, a PhD, a doctorate at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. At first, I wasn't even sure if I would finish it. I was just thinking, well, I would like to improve my Hebrew and I would love to get to know more Israelis and get into Israeli academia. So I'll just throw myself into this PhD program just for fun, you know. Yeah. Little did I know it's 
not exactly like getting married, but it's close with, you know, it was a seven year commitment in the end. After about two or three years, I realized, I guess I'm into this, so I might as well continue and do it. Yeah. So it took another seven years and then I finally got my PhD at Hebrew University. Okay, you've taught in a few places. Now you're at Azusa Pacific University teaching right. in the Honors College there. What are you right. teaching? Well, I'm teaching, Really, I'm a scripture scholar, and that was my whole formation, uh, both in Steubenville and uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, but now I'm teaching the great books, and so I'm teaching a little bit of Bible, but a lot of other books as well. So it's what are the great, great books? Stretch. Maybe some of our listeners don't know. Yeah, what sure, sure. Well, uh, last year I taught uh, Homer's Odyssey and Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and then we did some Old Testament, some New Testament. I taught St. Athanasius, Augustine's Confessions, and this semester I'm in the, the, the Middle Ages. So I taught Boethius, Thomas Aquinas next week, um, Dante's Divine Comedy. We're going to do Luther, Erasmus, Calvin, Teresa of Avila, and Shakespeare. Oh, very good stuff. Wow, that's full plate. It's good stuff, yeah. Now, there's a lot of things I know from talking yesterday that you're really passionate about. Yes. Things you, you love to talk about. And one of the things you you have a real concern about mm -hmm. is the whole battle that's going on with the gender issues Correct. in the culture. Yes. And I wonder if you'd just say a little bit about what you're seeing sure. and wh what you're doing, how you're helping people, how you're addressing it. Sure. This was a total surprise arriving at Azusa Pacific University as the scripture scholar. And you know my dissertation at Hebrew University was on nuptial symbolism in the New Testament in light of ancient Jewish writings. So I did a lot of work with the Song of Songs and basically the whole symbolism of God's covenant with his people as as a marriage covenant, so God and Israel and Christ and the church. So that kind of prepared me indirectly, even though my dissertation was much more on the theoretical level, level right? Ancient Jewish commentaries and so on. So, but of course, as we know, this is the issue of our day, all these questions of, of, of sexuality, marriage, uh, homosexuality, and now transgenderism and even gender identity. And I don't know if any institution has been left unscathed in the last uh, decades. Of course, it's been going on longer than that since the sexual revolution. But now we're really seeing the culmination of what I would call the de deconstruction of the human person that uh, goes back to the sexual revolution. So I have to say I was not entirely prepared for what I was expecting, for what was waiting for me because uh, Azusa Pacific University is uh, an evangelical university and college and that prides itself, its motto is God first, and it does have a statement which is pretty orthodox, which is orthodox of human sexuality as it's intended for one man, one woman within the covenant of marriage. But of course, living in the culture in which we live, uh, not everybody agrees with that. And so not a few of the students and of the faculty over there have different opinions. Let me ask you this, you, you said what we're fighting or what we're seeing is the mm -hmm. deconstruction of the human person, yes. the deconstruction of human anthropology. Yes. Just describe a little bit more what you mean when you say that. Well, you look at the Bible and it's right there at the very beginning, right? God made man ma male and female in the very image of God. He, he made them in the image and likeness of God. So the image and likeness of God, uh, not just because that's the only way to reproduce and to continue the species, uh, that it happens you need a man and a woman, but there's something that reflects the very nature of God. There's a uh, complementarity between male and female that is impossible between um, two men and two women and to, form a, to, to form a marriage together. And so that is, it's a no-brainer throughout scripture, of course, um, from, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Now, of course, as we said, we, we're seeing a complete deconstruction of that and questioning whether that is, is, is necessary, which goes not even to the question of marriage now, but of the question of who we are, of basically rejecting our very identity in God and basing our identity now in, in what theologically we might call the passions or the attractions, uh, con a concept that is, of course, unheard of in Scripture. Yeah, and so it's, it's no, we're not paying attention to our bodily integrity or about right. who we are as, as right. body persons, you know, right. Right. and everybody's, we, we're focusing mainly on our subjective feelings right. or subjective passions. Right. My feelings are my defining reality exactly. or passion is the core of my being. That's right. And so then you end up, the deconstruction is you end up uh, just ignoring who you are and how you're actually made. Right. And so the whole, there's a reaction against the bodily, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the body in some way as being a defining characteristic, not, not the only defining characteristic, but a fundamental 
defining characteristic yeah. of what it means to be human. Yeah. And then that, that then shows itself in marriage, as you're saying, between the complementarity between right. a man and a woman. Now, you tried to teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that go? Can I ask? Is that all right? Of like, course. What is, yeah. You can always ask. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I thought it was a bit foolhardy of me, but I taught a, uh, I'm still teaching a wisdom course, uh, which is mostly Old Testament wisdom. But you know, you read in Proverbs and books like uh, Sirach or the wisdom of Solomon and wisdom is always personified as a woman. And so wisdom is very closely related to marriage in the biblical books uh, and in, in the New Testament uh, as well. So I thought, well, my specialization is the Song of Songs, and let's bring some practical application to that. So I brought in some theology of the body, of course, which was popularized by, by John Paul II. Uh, very rich theological anthropology of, of the human person. So I brought it in a classroom. It was very polarizing. I would say most students were very grateful and still are. Some have asked me, you have to continue teaching this. We really need it. We have never heard something like this. This idea of the integrity of the human person, this battle between lust and love and lust within our heart, or love and concupiscence, um, this idea of love as self-gift and not love as self-gratification. Self so that, that was very well received. There was a small minority in my, my classes who really pushed back strongly against this idea that, that marriage, love, and sexuality, or at least marital love, is, is intended to be between one man and one woman. And to reject that is to do violence to ourselves, to our own bodies. And of course, it's, it's jeopardizing our salvation as well if we, if we reject God's moral order as far as love, marriage, and sexuality goes. The theology of the body, I think, is a great gift yeah. of our time. I think yeah. it's a, it was a kind of grace, a revelation almost, small yes. r for John Paul II. Uh, yes. And his whole, his whole the theological and phil philosophical development led to that and then mm. gives to the church at this time of such radical confusion, yes. you know, that's going on, uh, the, uh, a way to speak to, in a very loving, coherent, inspiring way, mm -hmm. uh, the challenges that we're facing today. But I, it's a little disappointing to see where currently some of the directions, some, some of the leaders in the church, right. they don't even want to talk about theology of the body right. anymore. Even at the family synods that went on right. a few years ago, two of them, it was hardly mentioned at all. Yes. That's a major mistake. There's a kind of, mm -hmm. there's a kind of uh, a compromise going on, trying to somehow fit into the world's new lo sexual logic in some kind right. of way. And I think it's radically inconsistent with the gospel. Yes, yeah. it's very and disappointing. And human nature, too. Yeah. Very disappointing. And it, it, as you said, in, an, in a day and age where we need strong leadership more than ever on the part of our bishops and our priests, uh, for us as Catholics, of course, and pastors and anyone else in the, in the Protestant world, um, we, we need strong and courageous leadership. And really, by virtue of our baptismal calling, every Christian is called to be a leader in this area. And there's a type of culture of cowardice, which on the one hand is understandable be because the, the radical left is using a tactic of intimidation, of, of name calling, of labeling anyone who disagrees with this agenda, uh, you know, the, the bigots and homophobes and all that. Whereas we're truly motivated by love, by the desire for the good, for the ultimate good of the human person. Yeah. And so there is a type of intimidation, but what we need to remind ourselves as, as believers, as baptized Christians, Catholics, is that we are called to speak the truth, especially the bishops and cardinals and leaders of the church. We need clarity on these issues. They need to be talked about. They need to be yeah. preached uh, in homilies and sermons. And for your common... Uh, Layman, we need to take a leadership role as well and not be cowed and intimidated and silenced in a day and age where especially our young people need so much guidance and so much, uh, so much direction. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a moment in the history of the church for us to, to hear the words of Jesus again from like yes. the Beatitudes where he yeah. said, you know, blessed are you if, if you're reviled or persecuted in some way because of the Son of Man or because of righteousness or because of what he teaches. And St. Peter said that uh, if this happens to you, like, for example, if you just share the truth with someone in your family or a friend or neighbor about these areas and people, the strategy in the world right now is don't let the church make an argument. Shut them down before the church is able to make an argument. Right. How do they do that? As soon as you begin to say something, they say you're a bigot, you're a hater, and you're not worth listening to. You're a little bit like a Klansman or something right. like that. You're a right. narrow, fundamentalist, mean, hurtful, all that kind of stuff, because they're trying to silence the, the argument that the church has of the Word of God. And this is a moment for us, friends, don't fall for that. 
Right. All right. Uh, but understand that the Lord said, I'll be with you in these moments. I'll strengthen you. And St. Peter said, if it happens to you, the glory of God is upon you. Yes. Right? Yes. So what kind of advice would you give to some of our listeners who yes. might be facing these kinds of challenges? Right. Well, first, we have to be well formed. And there is a huge problem. There's an irony that never have we had access to su such wonderful resources, right, with the Internet and the proliferation of books. But I'm not sure if, if we've seen such an age of widespread ignorance of the word of God. And so it's St. Jerome who famously said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And so as Catholics, as believers, we must be well versed, not only in scripture, but also in the catechism of the Catholic church. The catechism must be every Catholic's best friend. We absolutely need to be well versed in the faith of the, of the church because sadly, as we just said, often this, uh, the content of our faith is not passed down very well by some of those responsible who should be should be passing it down. So first we need to be well formed. We need to have a strong community among uh, like-minded uh, believers. And we have to be very aware that we are seeing the rise of a type of anti-church today. Uh, those who profess the names of Christians, and by this I mean both on the Catholic and Protestant side and really every denomination, uh, this rise of what some have called this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism. Yeah. This idea that God is a type of, of divine butler, cosmic therapist, who's always there to attend to your needs, but there's no more message of repentance, of conversion, of turning away from sin, of taking up your cross and following me. And so it's very easy to be deceived if we are not well-versed in scripture and in the faith of the church as passed down by the catechism. Yeah, it's so good. Boy, I'd like to do two, three more shows with you, Andre. Thank you so much for being with very us. Very gladly. It's, it's really so good. Friends, I wanna uh, just, mentioned to you this new booklet I wrote called The Unfailing Promises of God. This is really uh, what we need to lay hold of today. He's talking, Andre was talking about the importance of knowing scripture. Well, one of, the, one of the most important dimensions of scripture is internalizing the many, the hundreds, even thousands of promises that God gives to his people. He said, you know, be of good cheer. He said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I am with you always, right? I've overcome the world. And so he speaks to us from the heart. He speaks to our heart. And the word of God will strengthen us and give us everything we need. He said, don't be afraid when the time comes when you need, when you need to stand up and speak from your heart to speak the truth in love. I will be with you always, he said. So I'd like to offer you this booklet free, free of charge. Uh, call the 800 number on the, on the screen.